Sometimes, the simplest things are the most profound. Even simple words can have great power. In fact, seven words can change the trajectory of your life. Small words, big impact. Hello, my name is Wesley. I'm one of the pastors here at Heritage Church. How many of you guys are glad to be here? Well, this is Super Bowl weekend, so I got to ask, how many of you are cheering for the 49ers? Okay, that's like four people right there. Okay, how many of you are cheering for the Chiefs? Okay, there's one more group in here. How many of you could absolutely care less? Yeah, that's like everybody else. Half of you are just gonna show up to the Super Bowl party for the snacks. That's in the commercials, and the commercials too. We're all going to this guy's house right here after church for snacks. Well, again, we are glad to have you here. We're kicking off a brand new message series, Seven Words to Change Your Life. If you're new to Heritage, I certainly wanna welcome you you could have chosen to be anywhere this Sunday, but you chose to be here with us. We certainly do appreciate that. Do you want to mention a couple of very quick things? Inside of your program, you will see message notes. You can use those to follow along with today's message. You're going to see some Bible verses in there, some fill-ins. You can use those to track with today's message. We're also going to throw those same things on the big screen behind me. Or if you're more digitally inclined, you can go to the mobile app store on your smartphone and type in, Heritage Church MI, again, Heritage Space Church, Space MI, and you can download the Heritage Church app. There, you can take notes right on your smartphone. And then when you're done, you can email those to yourself, text those to yourself, or do whatever you like. We certainly encourage you to utilize that tool. So again, this series is called Seven Words to Change Your Life. Now, today's word is a powerful word. Today's word can open up doors to new opportunities. It is an exciting word. It's a joyous word. It is a word that is amazing. That word is... Yes, please. Is there sugar and syrup? Yes. Then yes. Yes. Yeah, baby. Yes. In a way, yes. You got it, dude. Yes, Holmes. Absolutely. Yeah. Time to start the fire. But the feet are going. I start the fire, I make the pizza. Hips are always going. Okay, be honest. How many of you have a go-to dance move like that? Be honest. Yeah, a lot of us do. I had never heard of the, the, the sprinkler until I saw one of the pastors here at Heritage do that. I died laughing. Never seen that before. So again, seven words to change your life. Today's message is yes. So at the top of your message notes, just write the word yes, that fill in that's there. The word is yes. I certainly encourage you to uh, attend Heritage over the next few weeks. Invite your families, invite your friends. It's going to be an awesome message series, and we don't want you or them to miss it. It's going to be awesome. So why is yes so important? Why is that such an important word? The reason is because some of the most significant moments in life are preceded by the word yes. How many uh, married people do we have in the room? If you're married, raise your hands. Raise your hands if you're married. Okay. Sir, what's your name? Mike. And what's your wife's name? Elaine. So we have Mike and Elaine. So Mike and Elaine, I've never met you before, but I guarantee that I know how you two met. Elaine, you probably saw Mike across a crowded room. And you said, oh. Everyone say, oh. oh. I know that's exactly how it happened. When you guys were dating, Elaine, I know that just the mere thought of Mike would make you melt. Elaine, I, I know that, that you had to stop buying Cheerios. You know why you had to stop buying Cheerios? 
Because when you would pour the cereal into the bowl and look down, you would see Mike's face. I knew Elaine, oftentimes you had to go to the hospital to get breathing treatments. You want to know why? Because Mike took your breath away. Now, again, I don't know you guys have never met, but word for word, isn't that exactly how you guys met? Mike is like, yes, yeah. she's like, heck no. <laughs> but I want you to get this point. That very simple yes that you gave Elaine, that very simple yes permanently changed the trajectory of your lives. So that word yes is a very, very, very powerful word. So now let's look at the Bible, God's word, to see why yes is so significant. 2 Corinthians 1, 18 through 20 says this. As surely as God is faithful, our word to you does not waver between yes and no. For Jesus Christ, the Son of God, does not waver between yes and no. He is the one whom Silas, Timothy, and I preach to you as God's ultimate yes. He always does what he says. For all of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ with a resounding yes. And through Christ, our amen, which means yes, ascends to the glory, ascends to God for his glory. Now, I'm going to come back to the part that says, and as God's ultimate yes, he always does what he says. I'm going to come back to that uh, in a uh, moment at the very end. We're going to discuss how Jesus Christ is God's ultimate yes to humanity. Talk about that in a second. But for right now, I want to look at this line where it says, for Jesus Christ, the Son of God, does not waver between yes and no. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, does not waver between yes and no. How many of you are glad that when God thinks about you, when God looks at you, that he does not waver? How many of you are glad about that? I don't care what you've done in your past. I don't care how bad you've messed up. I don't care how many skeletons you have in your closet. We understand that when God looks at you, he doesn't waver. His opinion doesn't waver. How many of you have acquaintances, you know people, that one day they liked you, but then the next day they talked about you behind your back? Have you ever had that happen to you before? I've had that happen to me before. But understand, God isn't that way. When God looks at you, his opinion doesn't change. When God looks at you, when God thinks of you, he does not waver. So maybe... You're wondering, God, do you want a relationship with me? Do you love me? God, will you forgive me? God, do you want the very best for my life? Will you take me back? Will you take me back even after that? Even after that, will you take me back? And the answer is a resounding yes. When God thinks of you, he doesn't waver. Now, this is an actual promise that God extends to us, that he extends to humanity. But there are thousands of promises that God extends to humanity. As a matter of fact, there are 7,457 promises in the Bible in all of them. Someone say all. all. All of them are God's yes. There are promises in the Bible related to God cleansing us, forgiving us, saving us. Promises that state that he will never leave us or forsake us. There are promises related to your children, your finances, your marriage. So if you're wondering, God, I don't know, do you want me to fulfill the purpose for my life? The answer is yes. God, do you want me to have a better a, a relationship with my spouse? The answer is yes. God, do you want me to have a better relationship with my children? The answer is yes. God, do you want me to have that promotion on my job? The answer is yes. God, do you want me to have healing in my body? The answer is yes. God, do you want me to have overflow in my life so that I can not only be a blessing to my family, but be a blessing to someone else? The answer is yes. All of God's promises are yes and amen. But, there's a but. 
someone's like, yeah, that sounded really good, but there's a but now. Here's the catch. If you want to receive God's promises, you must first say yes to God. So before you can get what he, what he has, you've got to say yes to him first. So there are three areas where we need to say yes to God. Number one, if you're taking notes, say yes to who God says I am. Say yes to who God says I am. Not to who people say you are. Not to them, not to that, but say yes to who God says you are. Maybe someone told you that you're fat. Maybe someone told you that you were ugly. Maybe someone told you that you would never amount to anything. Maybe someone told you that you would never succeed. And you have now adopted those labels into your life. Now, they are not labels that you gave yourself. These are labels that other people put on you, and you accepted those labels into your life. Let's just put that right here for a moment. I'm going to circle back to that. How many of you in this room have ever been driving down the street, and you got a ticket from the police for driving too fast? Raise your hand if that's ever happened to you. Okay. All right. Right there. How fast were you driving? I was doing a 71 and a 35. Okay. Everybody grab your smartphone message notes and throw it at that lady right there. Just throw it at her right now. 70, how, how fast? But it wasn't my car. Oh, it was not her, okay. Everyone extend your hands towards her. We're going to pray right now. Yeah. I'm going to use that one right there. When I get in trouble with something, hey, it wasn't my fault. I don't, I'm going to use that excuse the next time I see my doctor. Wesley, you're 50 pounds overweight. Ain't my fault. That is Dorito's fault. That is not my fault. I didn't do it. She was instigated. I don't even know what to say to that one right there. I'm still going to use that one. Again, when I go to the doctor, I'm using that one. But in the early 2000s, I actually got a, a ticket from the police, and I got the ticket, which is so funny, on a Sunday morning headed to church. So I'm headed to church, I get this ticket, officer comes to the window, I'm telling him, wasn't speeding, he says, you were speeding, we go back and forth, I get a ticket. I go to the court, and I determine I'm going to fight this ticket. I'm going to fight this ticket. I wasn't instigated, like some people on this side of the room. But I'm going to fight this ticket. So I go before the judge. I stand there. I give my case. And the judge still made me pay the ticket. But the point is this. As I was sitting there before all of the other cases went before me, I noticed something. After every single case, the judge would take this gavel. And he would take the gavel and he would slam it against the desk. When the judge slammed the gavel against the desk, that meant it's over. No more discussion, no more conversation, it is over. That's what it means. It doesn't matter what other people uh, may think. It doesn't matter if someone else has something to add after the fact. When the judge hits the desk, that's it, it's over. So it doesn't matter what labels other people try to give you. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what they said about you because God, the ultimate judge, has already spoken. He's already brought down the gavel. And what he says, and when he says it, that's it, conversation over. So now let's look at some labels from the Father. In your message notes, you will see it says examples. It says that we are more than conquerors. We are more than conquerors. It doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter what you feel. You are more than a conqueror. The judge said it. That's it. Conversation over. It says you are a new creation. How many of you have people in your life who like to bring up your past? 
Maybe they know what you've done. Maybe they know how you used to live. And they constantly want to bring that up to you. I don't care what they say. I don't care if they have knowledge of what you've done. The judge has spoken. The judge said, you're a new creation. That's it. Conversation over. You are loved. Maybe you feel unloved in your life right now. God said you're loved. That's it. Conversation over. You are God's masterpiece. A little further down in your notes. You are God's masterpiece. Maybe you're looking at your life and you're saying, you know what? I don't feel like a masterpiece. My life looks like a train wreck. What do you mean, God? I'm your masterpiece. No matter what you think, no matter what you feel, the judge has spoken. You are God's masterpiece. That's it. Conversation over. And that last one, you are forgiven. Maybe you did something in your past and you are holding on to that thing like a weight. You've never forgiven yourself for what you did back then. I don't care what you think, I don't care what you did, I don't care how you feel. The judge has spoken. You are forgiven, that's it, conversation over. So I want you to do this this week. I want you to go over those Bible verses. I want you to read them, I want you to digest them. I want you to understand that you are who God says you are, not how they labeled you. You are loved. You are more than a conqueror. You are a citizen of heaven. You are righteous and holy. You are complete. You are forgiven. Adopt the labels that God has given and reject those other labels. Does that make sense to everybody? Point number two, say yes to what God tells you to do. One of the clearest ways, and this is Adam Weber speaking, one of the clearest ways I can see if someone's growing in their relationship with God is that person's willingness to say yes to God, to big things, to small things, and particularly to things that don't make sense or are out of one's comfort zone. It can be scary to trust God when you can't see what's next, when you can't see what's around the corner. It can be very scary to trust God in that regard. How many of you are organized people? You're really organized, you've got your planner, you've got your calendar, you've got everything color-coded, you've got that chart at home that shows all of the kids and what activities they're in and where they need to be by when. It can be very difficult for organized people to trust God. You wanna know why? Because oftentimes, God will only give you the very next step. He doesn't give you all of the steps. He doesn't give you the full story. Oftentimes, God will give you only the very next step to obey. So it can be very difficult trusting God when you don't have all of the pieces to the puzzle, when you don't know how it's all going to work out. Got to share this with you. My daughter and I, We take these random road trips all the time. We will literally hop in the car and just drive. Like, we'll get up on a Saturday morning and just, you know what? Maybe we should just drive to the west side of Michigan. We do that all the time, just hop in the car. So this particular day, we hopped into the car. We got on I-75 and just headed north. I don't know where we were going, but we were just headed north. That's where we're going. We ended up in Frankenmuth. And as we're driving down that main street to get to all of the shops in Frankenmuth, I see Bronner's, but then I see another sign that says zip line. And I'm like, okay, this is what we're doing today. This is it. We're going zip lining. So I pull in, I park, we get out of the car, and I walk into the zip line park, and then I say, okay. It's a little more intense than I thought, but... You know what? We're going to do this. We're going zip lining. Ladies and gentlemen, I kid you not. I walk into the little hut where you pay the money and get all of your equipment, and there's this 17-year-old kid standing there. And I'm thinking, this is not the kid that's going to help me fly through the air up there. But he was the kid. 
So he goes on to explain how the zip lining works, and he uh, gets us in the harness, and he's giving all of the instructions, and he's saying, you need to hook here, hook here, do not pull this, pull that, hook, 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 you're done. I'm like, wait a minute. That was way too fast. I need the zip lining instructions for dummies. That was way too fast right there. So he had to explain everything all back over again. So we get outside. I've got the harness on. I'm standing there, and it just occurred to me to ask a question. This was my question. I asked him, uh, excuse me, will this contraption that I'm in really hold me up? And he said, sir, there are people much larger than you that have gone on this zip line. And I kind of looked around and I said, well, other people aren't here right now. My question is, will this contraption hold me up? That's my question. And after some conversation, he assured me that it would. So now I got this on, I walk up the steps, and I get to the very edge of the platform. And I'm standing there on the edge of the platform. And I'm ready to go on the edge of the platform at any moment. I'm just waiting. He says, sir, you know that you can go ahead and go. I know that I can go right now. I'm literally about to fly through the air attached to one string. Give me a moment. So I decided, you know what? I'm just going to do this. I'm going to go for it. My daughter is with me. The line is now backed up behind me now. I'm going to do this. I grab on. I lean back. And I sail through the air. And you know what? I actually lived. I sailed through the air, got to the other side, and it was absolutely uneventful. Here's the point. After doing it one time, I gained the confidence that I could do it again. I don't know how the whole apparatus with the, all of the hooks and the harness works. I don't know how they have all of the, the trees connected with wires and all of that. I don't know how all of that stuff works. But after trusting the process the first time, I had confidence to do it the second time. As you are interacting with God, I want you to understand that. When you obey God the first time, you will get the confidence, the assurance that God is trustworthy, that he will never leave you, that he will be by your side, that he will hold you up. You will get that confidence when you obey him the first time which will give you the confidence to obey him the second time. Proverbs 3 says this. Let's read this all together. Ready, read. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Stop right there, look at the person next to you, and say, that was for you. <laughs> Do not depend on your own understanding. Do not depend on your own understanding. Pastor Wesley, you don't know, I love him. He's the greatest thing. And he treats you horrible, but he's the greatest thing. Do not depend on, that. somebody needed to hear that today. Do not depend on your own understanding. But it goes on to say, seek his will in all you do and what will happen. Is there an area of your life right now where you need to obey God? Because if you obey God the first time, it will give you the confidence and assurance to obey him the second time. Is there an area in your life right now where you need to obey God? Maybe you're here, and your first step of obedience, maybe, is to accept Christ into your life. Maybe that's your first step. For someone else, maybe your first step, I don't know, is to get baptized. Maybe that's the area where you need to obey God. We're baptizing here at Heritage Church February 29th through March 1st. So that's Saturday and uh, Sunday. 
We would love to baptize you uh, during that weekend. You can sign up right now at experienceheritage.org. But what is your next step? Maybe you're already a Christian. Maybe you've already been baptized or, and you've already accepted Christ. Maybe you've already done all of that stuff. Maybe your act of obedience is to apologize to your wife. Maybe your act of obedience is to apologize to your husband. Well, I'm not apologizing because they did it first. No. Even if they instigated you, we're coming back to that. I'm never going to forget that as long as I live. I was instigated. Even if they did that, it's no excuse. <laughs> but maybe you need to apologize. Maybe you need to forgive someone who really hurt you, who really did something wrong to you. Maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's a friend. Maybe that's your act of obedience, that you need to forgive someone. See, as a Christian, your yeses to God keep going. It's not one yes, it's a continual yes. It doesn't stop. Where do you need to say yes to God in your life? That's the question. If you obey God the first time, you'll have the confidence and assurance to obey him the next time. John 15, 14 says, and you are my friends if you do what? If you obey me. Point number three, say yes to the gift God wants to give. Say yes to the gift that God wants to give. Romans 3, 23 through 25 says, everyone has sinned and fallen short of God's glorious standard. Who has sinned? Everybody. Everyone has sinned and fallen short of God's glorious standard and all need to be made right with God by his grace. Who needs to be made right with God? All of us. So as a result of sin, all of us need to be made right with God. They need to be made free from sin through Christ Jesus. How do you get free from sin? Through who? Through Christ Jesus. God sent him to die in our place to take away our sins. So God sent Jesus to die on the cross just for you and just for me. He did that because he loves us. Jesus paid a debt for you that you could not pay. So we missed God's mark. So God had a mark, and that's literally what sin means. It means to miss the mark. God set a mark. As a result of sin, we missed that mark. As a result of missing the mark, having sin in our life, there is a cost to that. What is the cost? Romans 6, 23 through 24. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. What is a wage? Anyone, shout it out. What's a wage? Something you earn. So, who is my couple? Mike. Mike, when you, because I'm not asking the other person over there who drives 70 and a 30. We're not talking to her right now. So, Mike, um, when you get your paycheck, do you go up to the human resources person, whoever gives you your paycheck, and do you say, oh, my goodness, this job loves me so much because they give me free money every week. They want to be a blessing to me and to my family and to my kids. This job loves me so, so much. Do you do that every week when you get paid? But but why not? Because you worked for it. You earned it. Getting a paycheck is the rightful payment for working 40 hours. Let's insert that back into this verse. For the rightful payment... For sin is death. Okay, see you guys next week. Have fun. How many of you are glad the story doesn't end right there? It says, comma, but. The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, 
our Lord. Eternal life is a what? It's a gift. You can't earn it. You can't work your way into heaven. It is a free gift from the Father. So if you're saying, okay, Pastor Wesley, I think I get this. It makes sense. Man had a sin problem. We missed God's mark. There was a cost for sin. Jesus paid the cost for the sin that I have in my life. I need to say yes to Jesus. So how do I practically say yes to Jesus? How do I practically invite Jesus into my life? So glad you asked. Romans 10 and 9 says this. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It seems so simple. It seems so easy. And God says, yes, it is that easy. Confess with your mouth, believe in your heart, and you will be saved. So the question is, have I said yes to God's yes to me? Over the past week, I'm sure you've seen it on the news or maybe, I don't know, social media, the tragic, tragic accident with Kobe Bryant, his daughter, and uh, all of the nine people who were on the helicopter. It's just a tragic event. One thing out of that that I'm encouraged about is I heard that Kobe Bryant that morning went to his church. Prior to the 7 a.m. service, he went to his church to pray. Now, I, I don't know what he prayed about. I don't know what he talked to God about. I don't know. I've never met him, never seen him in person before. But I am comforted by the fact that one of his last acts here on earth was to talk to God. I think that's awesome. Now, I am sure, again, I've never met him, but I am sure that he thought that he was going home that day. I'm sure that he thought that he would see his family again. I am sure that he thought that he would see his wife again. I am sure that he thought that he would see his other children again. But as someone said, life is short and tomorrow is not promised. Maybe you're here right now and you've put off accepting Christ. You put it off. You said, you know what, I'll, I'll do that another time. Or maybe, just maybe you thought, well, I live a pretty decent life here on earth. I haven't killed anybody. Maybe God will just let me into heaven. I want to be absolutely clear. Maybe you need to write this down. It's in Ephesians 2 and 9. Salvation is not a reward for the good deeds that we have done, lest men would boast about it. Salvation is not a reward for the good deeds that we have done. So if you think by being good, a good little boy, good little girl, that you're going to make it into heaven, you are sadly mistaken. You do not access heaven as a result of being good. You access heaven as a result of accepting Jesus into your life. So will you say yes to God's ultimate yes? Jesus was God's ultimate answer for humanity. Jesus is God's ultimate yes. Will you say yes to God's ultimate yes? Tomorrow is not promised. In eternity is a very, very long time. So you want to be crystal clear and absolutely sure about where you're headed. Every eye closed. If you're here right now and you're thinking, you know what, Pastor Wesley, yes, this is my time. I'm not 100% sure of where I'm going when I die. I mean, I thought that by being good that God may just let me in, but now I understand that it's not by my good works, but it's by accepting Jesus into my life. If you're here and you want that assurance, you want that assurance that when you close your eyes for the last time here on earth, you will wake up in the arms of Jesus. If you want that assurance, we're going to pray a very simple prayer to invite Jesus into our lives. There's nothing magical about this prayer. The sky isn't going to op open up and the earth won't shake. It's just a simple prayer to invite Jesus 
into our lives. Maybe you say this. Maybe you say, Lord, I need you in my life. God, I recognize that I've put you off. I recognize that I have not put you first in my life. But I need you now. Jesus, come into my life. Come into my heart. Forgive me for my sins. Be Lord over my life. Right now, here today, I say yes to you, Jesus. On February 2nd, I say yes to you. I want you to be my Savior and my Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for all that you have done for me. And thank you, Jesus, for being God's ultimate yes in my life. Amen.